Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And today is the sacred occasion of this is the sacred month of Kartik, and as we sign the Damodar Ashtakam. So I'll speak on the topic of how our longing for love is best fulfilled in Krishna. And we'll I'll talk about this particular verse and based on that I will address this topic. <clears throat> now all of, all of us at our very core, we have many desires, but our deepest desire is ultimately the longing to love and be loved. We may want good looks, we may want a lot of wealth, we may want education qualifications, we may want professional positions. Uh, we want all of these because we hope that through all of these, we will attract someone's love. We want to become more lovable in other people's eyes. And this is a very deep and universal logic. Not just in human beings, but in all living beings. And this longing, the Bhakti tradition explains, it originates from the soul. And it is meant to be directed ultimately to the whole. The soul is a part of the whole. And as long as the soul is dis the, the whole is the ultimate reality, the absolute truth. As long as the soul is disconnected from the whole, the soul has a hole in the heart. Soul always feels a sense of emptiness and incompleteness. And because of that, we always keep craving, no matter how much we have, something more, something more, something more. And this way, we often end up perpetually dissatisfied. So this longing for love is best fulfilled when we direct it toward the ultimate reality. Why? Because that ultimate reality, the Bhagavad Gita describes, is the source of all attractiveness. Yadyad vibhuti matsatvam shri madhurjita mevava Everything attractive in this world manifests a spark of the Lord's splendor. And that means the Lord is like an ocean of attractiveness. And the various objects in this world are like drops of attractiveness. Now what is this ocean of attractiveness? There are different theistic traditions in the world and they all urge us to direct our hearts and life towards God. <laughs> but the Bhakti tradition from ancient India gives the most vivid revelation of God. Basically, on any, if you are going to take any journey, say if you decide from here you want to go to the Bay Area, then if you want to go there, there should be something there which makes the journey worthwhile. The, if the destination is attractive, that's when we feel the need to go there. Sometimes we travel because of business, sometimes we travel because of profession, sometimes we travel because of pleasure, whichever way. We, some, there should be something over there that makes the journey worthwhile. So similarly for us, if we are to direct our heart from the world toward the Lord, what is it that will make that journey worthwhile? So, there are many traditions which talk about how God's punishment should be feared. And in the Bible it is said, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that at one level is true. We all need to have a certain level of fear of the consequences of our actions. Because the world acts according to natural laws. Now, some people sometimes, suppose somebody slips and falls down. So, did you fall down? He says, no, I was just testing if gravity still works. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if, you, if somebody walks up a 10-story building, 
and they say, I was testing gravity. Well, if you put gravity to test, gravity will put you to rest. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are immutable laws in the world and ultimately we need to harmonize with them. And these laws work under the uh, supervision of the Supreme. So, Maya Dhyakshed Prakriti Suyate Sachara Acharam Hetu Nane Nekaudeya Jagat Vipari Vartate Krishna says that the laws of material nature work under his supervision. So, uh, at one level, fear of God is essential because it's, otherwise we are disharmonious with the way the nature works and that will have consequences. But God is not just an object to be feared. Nor is God just an ob a person to be venerated, to be respected with holding hands. That's, that's true, but there's much more than that. And beyond that, God is an object to be loved. So broadly speaking, there are Bhaktivinoda Thakur is a prominent Acharya, he's a great Vaishnava saint and scholar. And he analyzed the world's various religions and uh, wisdom texts. And based on that, he said that people may approach transcendence, the ultimate reality, at four different levels. Fear, desire, duty, and love. So fear is if I don't obey God, He will punish me. Therefore, let me obey Him. That's fear. And, okay, that's also, some, some amount of fear is also good. Now, it is said that a person who has no fear of God is a person whom we should fear. <laughs> because then they have no conscience. They will do anything at all. So, fear of God is important. But that doesn't mean we live perpetually in terror of God. This fear is more like a child. Uh, it's not so much fear of punishment or fear as fear of displeasing someone whom we love. A child shouldn't be terrified of the parents. But a child should have some fear of the parents. That my parents, I said, that's how obedience comes. So fear is one level. Then beyond that is desire. Desire means that if I worship God, He will give me what I desire. So this is at least a little more positive conception that we are approaching God because we want something from Him. And we think that He will give that. Not that He will punish us, but He will provide us something desired. So this is positive, but still this is not a full relationship. It's like uh, maybe a, a child who's grown up with a college student or, and the only time that a college student calls the parents is when he or she wants money. Well, at least he's calling it that time, the parents will be happy. But still, that's not a very palatable relationship. So if we go to God only to ask for things from Him. And in, the, in Christianity, there is a prayer, O oh Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us our daily bread. So Prabhupada would say that it is good that they're approaching God for bread. But this prayer, taken literally, shows people's love for bread, not love for God. And if they can start getting bread from some other means, then there is no need for God. So desire is also not a very steady level. Above that is duty. And at the level of duty, the idea is not that God will provide me things, but God has already provided me so much. Our very existence depends on so many things which are beyond our power to arrange for. Right now we are living, we are taking in air. We don't produce that air. Even if we say, I work hard and earn money to produce my food, to get on my, uh, keep on my food, but still we don't produce food, the church produces food. And even after food is produced, we eat it, but we don't digest it. Scientists have been trying to create artificial replacements for dysfunctional bodily parts. It's like some days an arm that doesn't work, you can have prosthetic limb. So if the heart is a problem, you can have a pacemaker. If the kidney is not working, you can have a dialysis unit. So they try if somebody's digestion doesn't work, can we have an artificial digestive machine? 
they found that what we need is not a machine but a factory. <laughs> and not just a factory, at least three years ago, four years ago, they said the factory will run 51 miles. Maybe with nanotechnology it becomes smaller. But it's an incredibly complicated process how digestion happens. So the only time Hare Krishna. The only time we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> so if God gives and forgives, we get and forget. So the, the level of duty, our very existence is dependent on many things beyond our own capacities. And that is a person who is thoughtful feels that God has already provided me so much. So I have a duty to worship him, a duty to serve him. This is a more mature state where, say, the child has grown up, tells you the child has become an adult, and then feels grateful. My parents are so much for but these are all progressively higher levels. The highest level is what level? Love. Love of God. And at the level of love of God, one is interested in God not for what God does for us, but for what God is or who God is. So for, for this level to be approached, we need to see God not just as the provider of desirables, but we need to see God as the supreme desirable. And how do we see God as the supreme desirable? That vision, that revelation is provided by the Bhakti tradition. And here we see this is a very intimate vision of Krishna in the Dhamma Rashtaka. The first verse described how Yashodamai uh, Krishna is running away and Krishna is tired. And when he is tired, what is happening? Nama Mahadeshu is angry with him. And Rudantam, this is the verse which we sang just now. Rudantam, Mugurnetram, Yudvam, Rujantam. Rudantam, Krishna is crying. Now, the words with this tradition talk about fear of God. But here, there is fear in God. God is fearful. So what is going on here? Who can God be afraid of? No. Is can anybody be more powerful than God? No. But the idea is, this is such an enduring vision of the divine. That yes, God has an official role. He is the judge. He is the overseer of the universe. But just like everybody has their professional roles, and they have their personal life. So the bhakti tradition has revealed especially God at his home, God in Vrindavan. He is in his home, he doesn't delight in the exhibition of God. He delights only in the reciprocation of love. And for that reciprocation of love, he takes on whatever low role is required. So the world's theologies, various theologies, theology is the study of God. So various theologies have talked about God in many different ways. But the Bhakti theology has one unique revelation. And that unique revelation is the concept of Lila. Leela means play. That's play or pastime. What it means is that God in his personal life, just for the reciprocation of love, performs sweet pastimes and takes whatever role is required for, the for facilitating and intensifying the reciprocation of love. It's like somebody might be a big millionaire, even a billionaire. And though they're billionaires, maybe they have family get together. And then that billionaire may start doing a drama. And in that drama, that billionaire is acting like a weather. And he says, I have not eaten for three days. Please give me some food. They may have eaten thrice on the same day. <laughs> but in the drama, in the drama, they act 
that way. And actually, it's not just acting for the sake of acting. In the sense that a drama is relished most when the characters actually enter into the world. The characters start experiencing emotions the way the depicted role is being played. And then the audience also enters into it. So, and that way, they play various roles and have sweet interactions. Just as a billionaire might play the role of a beggar, similarly, the Supreme Lord, who is the father of all living beings, takes the role of a child. And in that role of a child, he is acting fearfully. Now, why particularly a child? The idea is that God experiences and relishes all the rich gamut of relationships that we long for in the world. So we, now God is the supreme being, but if everybody is simply adoring and worshipping Him, then there is only one flavour to that relationship. And I've traveled across the world, I've interacted with some very famous people, some celebrities also. So at one level, often they tell, uh, if you get too little close to them, they tell that actually, the higher you get, to, the closer you get to the top, the lonelier it becomes. Because what happens, you have many admirers, and when you have fans, when you have admirers, in front of your fans, you always have to put on a front. A front of being perfect, or flawless, of having a magnetizing personality. And you cannot be yourself. This is one of the great ironies of life. That sometimes people struggle lifelong to become famous. And once they become famous, then they have to put on black sunglasses and masks to go for a normal walk. <laughs> because they may get mobbed. And they just, they want to, many of the celebrities whom I interact, interact with, I just want to be treated like a normal human being. Now most people feel, I want to be treated like a special human being. Yeah, that is true, that's a desire which everyone has. But we all want a wide variety of relationships, not just one flavor. So God doesn't delight in his God. He wants a rich flavor of relationships. And among those various rich flavors of relationship, one is a parental relationship. Although he is the supreme parent of everyone, he wants that he become a child and he get the love of a parent. And there are devotees who wish to serve him in that way. Now, now when I say this is a Leela is a play or a pastime, it is not false. It is not a it is not a show. It is actually everybody enters into that and delights in that. So when Krishna and his devotees are performing pastimes as they do in Vrindavan, actually every one of them enters into that role. And just like if a person is a billionaire and they, while acting as a beggar, they maintain that swagger of being a billionaire. But they can't, they, 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 you're, you're artificial, isn't it? Some, play, some people do some acting, but they are like wooden actors. You know, they're just going through the motions, but there's no emotion. So to not just go through the motion, but to go to the emotion, one has to enter into the room. So Krishna, actually, when he starts playing the role of a small baby, a small child, he's entering into that role. And Mother Yashoda enters into that role. And Mother Yashoda, she is, she is concerned, she is upset, she is angry. That why is Krishna being mischievous like this? So what has happened previously? That Mother Yashoda was offering her breast milk to Krishna. And suddenly a stop nearby where she had put some milk. That's, the milk started overflowing. So Krishna, she saw the milk is overflowing and she just left Krishna. Now, she put Krishna down and she went away. And Krishna was with eyes closed, taking milk from his mother's breast. And suddenly, he thought milk is gone, what happened? 
It's like suppose we are savoring a feast and with a bowl of sweet rice and we take one spoon and we eat it and then we close our eyes and relish it and then we put our spoon down. There's no play to Hey, what happened? Where did you go? <laughs> we will get agitated. So, like that, Krishna got agitated. He saw me, you know, she's gone there. She's left me. He got angry. He got angry. He said, what should I want? He was angry and he was hungry. Both. So, uh, so, sorry? Angry. So, what? Hungry. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Who? Hungry, okay, that's a nice word. <laughs> so, because of this, he thought, what should I do? He saw some milk somewhere, he saw some pots where there was some, there's yogurt, some butter, and just broke those pots, ate as much as he could, and initially was, when we are angry, we do certain things. And then after that, when the anger cools down, what did I do? <laughs> See, if we get angry and then we lash out with our anger, we will give the best. If we are angry and we speak, we will give the best speech that we will regret. <laughs> <laughs> so, he first broke the pots, ate, and then had some, did some mischief, and then he, hey, maybe I did too much here. And then he said to run away from that. He ran away and tried to hide in another room. But then, still little anger was there. So there also, he tried to bring some pots and give some milk to the, some, give some butter to the monkeys. So Mother Yashoda came in quietly from behind. And there's so a whole pastime where she tried to run and run. And Krishna tried to catch him. Krishna ran away for a long time. And finally, Krishna was caught. Now when Krishna was running away, he was really afraid. What will the mother do? And then, when he finally caught, when he was finally caught, he's scared the mother is going to punish me. So now he's crying. So Rudantam Mugur Netram. Rudantam is crying. Mugur again and again is crying. Netram from his eyes. Yugma Rujantam. Both his tears are coming out. What is happening? Kara Ambhoja with his hand, with his two hands, which are like lotuses. Yugmena Satam Kanitra. So he's crying and he's trying to wipe his tears with his hands. And Atanka. Atanka is terror. We have Atanka Vadi, terrorists. So Atanka is terror. So Sa Atanka means with terror. So Krishna is crying. Sometimes we are, if we have done something wrong and somebody is angry with us, we don't even have the courage to look up at them in the eyes. And then so Krishna is looking down, and he's looking up. Is my mother still angry? Okay, again looks down. So Satan Kanetra, his eyes are filled with tears. And because he had just led his mother on a merry chase and tried to run away and escape. So because of that, he's also breathing heavily. Mubushwasa Kamba, that he is breathing heavily, he is chest is heaving because of that. And three rekhanga kanta. So his, on his neck, three lines are formed. As his chest is moving up and down, and those three lines are traditionally considered to be a sign of beauty. And sthita grivam damodaram bhakti baddam. And that Lord Damodar is eventually bound by the rope of his mother. So here we see the complete inversion of hierarchy. Normally a soul lives in fear of God, but here God is in fear of the soul. And how does that work out? Because Krishna is hungry for the love of his devotees. And if a devotee desires to express love in a particular way, Krishna does everything that will enhance that loving relationship. Means he will, if he is a child, he will act as the most endearing child. Now, the most endearing child who is it? Sometimes the child is very well behaved, is obedient. That's nice. But like in every relationship, uh, there are different mellows which flavor the relationship. 
See, for any relationship uh, to be sustained, there has to be a certain amount of predictability and a certain amount of unpredictability. If there is only predictability in a relationship, then it becomes almost like we are interacting with a robot. I know if I speak this, that's what this person will speak. I do this, this person will do this. If I go, if, I, uh, we can, if we can entirely predict anyone's behavior, then it becomes so predictable that it becomes boring out of It's like interacting with the robot. But on the other hand, if a person's behavior is entirely unpredictable, then also the relationship becomes very unstable. Because when we say something, we don't know what they are going to say. You know, what will make somebody angry? What will make somebody annoyed? It becomes, if it's completely unpredictable, then the relationship has no stability. It's almost like we are walking on a territory where there is a minefield below. So which step will cause a boom, an explosion, we don't know. So too much unpredictability is also not healthy for a relationship. So basically every relationship to be alive and healthy needs a balanced blend of predictability and unpredictability. Just as it applies in relationships, the, 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 the predictability in one sense stabilizes the relationship and the unpredictability spices the relationship. It's like when we eat food, we want it to be nutritious, but we also want it to be tasty, something to spice to it. Oh, when we say we do something and say other oh, person, hey, I didn't expect you to say that. That's interesting. And what happens when we interact with people, the more we interact with them and we see them in different settings, different scenarios, then we get to know them more and more. So each life situation, it's like suppose you go to a uh, you go to do some photo shoot. And then, at that time, the camera will pretend to stand in different poses, different postures, and take photos from different angles. So then, some posture becomes very attractive, and that becomes like a profile photo or whatever. So similarly, each situation that we are we are in, or each situation in which we interact with some other person, that's like a different frame, a different setting in which we see that person, and that way. Different situations, they reveal different aspects of that person to us. And so similarly, Krishna, when he acts as a child, he has this healthy blend of predictability and unpredictability. So when he is when he's hungry, he will come to his mother and start crying, he's demanding, I want food. So when, when he starts pulling at her, uh, pulling at her sari and says, Krishna, she knows I'm hungry now. Even if he doesn't speak, he knows, she knows that. So there is some amount of predictability. He's hungry, what he will do. But then there is some amount of unpredictability also. So Mother Yudha didn't think that if I just put him down, he will go and break all this. And at, uh, in Ananda Vrindavan Champu, which is a book written by Kavi Karnapur, where the Krishna Leela that is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the 10th canto, is further elaborated by Kavi Karnapur. Then he describes very beautifully what goes on in Mother Yashoda's mind? Why is she so upset that he's broken some pots? You could say, oh, just a big mess. I have to clean it up. But that's not the only thing. Mother Yashoda started thinking that till then, now Krishna was small, but she said, if Krishna is mischievous like this, and he will develop a reputation of being mischievous. If now Mother Vishuddha had heard from some of the other gopis that Krishna sometimes comes and steals butter from us. And she had never believed it. Said, Why will Krishna steal butter? And Krishna also, he is such a sweet boy that sometimes some people do wrong and then they make such a face that you think, I can't punish this person. So this, they act so sweet and innocent and harmless. So, oh, Krishna said that I didn't steal. Yashodamaya, why would I steal? You, know, you have the best butter at home. <laughs> so, when you have the best butter, why should I go and steal anyone's place? Says the mother Krishna said, oh, why are they saying like this? Oh, you know, actually, they're envious of you. That you, I told your butter, not their butter. 
So Krishna, although he's small, he knows how to flatter his mother also. So then his mother doesn't believe it. But then she still has a worry. Sometimes what happens? When we hear something negative about someone whom we love, at one level we don't want to believe that because we trust that person. But still that thought stays in the mind. Could there be some truth in this? And then if we see anything else which is similar, then that is activated again. So now then what happened to me? Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So you should know I had that fear Is Krishna really like a thief? Does he go and steal? And then she saw that he, in her own house he was doing the same thing. <laughs> that he had broken those pots and then he sneaked out to another, another cham chamber where this man was stored and then he was stealing from over there. So she became worried. She became upset not just because he had made a mess of things but she was upset. What does this mean? Love at one level means that we are concerned about the other persons of the object whom we love, person whom we love. But that love has that concern has two aspects. There is concern for the other person's feelings, and there is concern for the other person's future. Both are in a dynamic tension. Say that means if a, if a child doesn't want to study, then the mother may have to speak very strongly, you have to study. But a child may get upset, child may start crying. But the mother is concerned about the child's feelings. But it's not only about the feelings. And the child mother is also concerned about the future. And for your future well-being, you must study. So if we are concerned only about our loved one's feelings and not their future, then that is attachment. If we are concerned only about the future and not their feelings, then that is insensitivity. But when we are concerned about their feelings, their present feelings and their future, both, that is mature love. That is, that is a genuine affection. So now Krishna, Mother Ishwada, she was concerned, what will happen if Krishna steals like this, he will grow up and steal more and more. And then, if he develops, if he develops a reputation that he is stealing, then parents, especially in traditional settings, always have a worry. She starts thinking, if Krishna develops a reputation that he is a thief, then who will give their daughter in marriage to him? <laughs> <laughs> and why Krishna will have to stay alone then? No, no, she gets upset by that. So she starts getting worried because of this. And thus, she gets angry. She's, she's not just angry because she has made a mess, but she's worried about his future. And thus she catches him and she has a stick with her. And she's okay, stick. And then Krishna says, look at the stick of Krishna. And she's terrified. And Mother Isha thinks, okay, I don't want to really scare him. I don't want to scare him so much that he becomes paranoid. So then she puts the stick away. And Krishna is Mother Isha thinks that you cannot go scot free like this. So some punishment has to be there. So what to do? Then she looks around and she says, okay, the Krishna has to be punished. She says, I'll tie you up. See, now what happens for all of us, mobility is a basic freedom that we all want. Like when people are put in the prison, what has happened? Their mobility is restricted. And that is painful. And especially for children to be made immobile, children have so much energy. Especially when they're 5, 6, 10 years old, uh, they can exert in maybe 2 hours as much energy as we exert in maybe 20 hours. They're so much active there. 
So now for children to be immobilized, that is an especially painful punishment. It's not physically painful, it is the rope is tied around them, but it is, it is actually very, it is, it is, it is a big deprivation for them. Now, of course, if Mother Yashoda had been there today, you know, domestic abuse charges would have been filed against her. <laughs> So, <laughs> the ways of parenting have changed. It was completely out of love. And out of love, she wanted to restrain Krishna. And when she wanted to restrain Krishna, at that time, she tied a rope and she found that the rope just wasn't enough. And she added some more rope. And she added some more rope. And that itself is a very beautiful pastime of how Krishna... No matter how much rope Mother Yashoda applied, she just couldn't tie him at all. So what is happening over here? Even when Krishna is a small child, he still remains God. He still retains all the potency of God. And when he wants, he can manifest that potency. So Krishna sometimes plays with his mother. And of course, one is just childhood, childish, child, childlike play with mother. His mother, but sometimes while playing, suddenly he manifests his omnipotence, his divinity. Which is another famous pastime in which Krishna was suddenly revealed to Mother Shoda that he is he's God or he's divine. He's not an ordinary child. Eating mud. Yes, eating mud. After that, when does he actually show? What does he do? <laughs> Yes. So, Mother Ishada hears that Krishna has eaten mud. Balram and others come and say, No, no, I haven't eaten mud. He said, No, are, are they lying? Oh, no, they just they want to get me into trouble. He said, No, but do you think your, your, uh, your Dauji Balram will lie? Krishna doesn't say anything at that time. So, okay, go open your mouth. And he opens his mouth. And now, normally, if our mouths are opened, Probably we might see some dental fissures. <laughs> <laughs> some cavities or something like that. But when she opens the mouth, he opens the mouth and she sees the whole universe in Krishna's mouth. And not only does she see a whole universe, she actually sees the whole universe and she sees Vrindavan. And in Vrindavan, she sees herself. And she sees herself looking at Krishna's mouth. So, it's like sometimes in in computers or in, you have a like picture in picture. So, you have a big picture which has a small picture. But in a picture in picture technology, you, if you see the viewer sees themselves. So, it's like that Krishna reveals and Mother Yashoda starts thinking, what is going on? Am I, is this, am I asleep and am I dreaming? Or is this uh, some kind of illusion which Maya has put me in? She says, she, uh, she says, I'm sleeping. She pinches us. No, I'm not sleeping. I'm awake. She says, Maya put me in some illusion. She says, I'm, I'm simply an innocent coward girl, a coward woman. Why would Maya bother with me? Why would she mess with me? And he says, Dad, is Krishna some extraordinary boy? Is Krishna some celestial, some god? He says, no, who is Krishna? How can he be god? He says, when he is hungry, he starts crying and he can't wait even for a few moments. If he can't even control his senses, how can he be God? He says, I am confused. What is this? What is going on? And as he sees his mother getting confused like this, she starts thinking, maybe you know, this is something extraordinary is going on. Maybe. And she's, her mood slowly starts changing towards reverence toward Krishna. And Krishna doesn't like that mood of reverence. Aishwarya shithil bhakti na ishwari na bhujaya. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said that if with his intimate devotees, if Krishna finds that they are approaching him with great reverence, that he feels weakens their devotion, weakens the intensity of the affection. And therefore he says he doesn't want this. So Krishna exhibits this temporarily and then he stops. 
And he, Mother Yashoda opens, uh, looks, suddenly she looks and he says, Oh, it's Krishna with his open mouth. And the whole universe has disappeared. He says, What happened? And as she is thinking, uh, Mother, Krishna suddenly says, Ma, Maya, I'm hungry. And he runs to her and hugs her. Mother Yashoda forgets everything. All that she has seen. So similarly over here, so sometimes Krishna plays and he exhibits his omnipotence sometimes. And that, that is what he also does over here now. But the is trying to tie him. At one level, she has caught him. He has caught him, he's fearful, and she has tied him to the grinding mortar. Uh, Krishna had been standing on that grinding mortar, and as he was standing on the grinding mortar, he was reaching out to the butter pots, breaking the butter pots, getting the butter from there, and feeding various monkeys around him. So, especially in childhood, there is a tendency for parents to personify the objects with which the children play. Just like if a child maybe hits their head against a wall and the parents may come, oh, this, this wall hurt you? I slap this wall. I slap. And then they say, I punish this wall. And the child feels a little good by that. So, and children have their toys and they make new names for their toys and they personify their toys. So similarly, what Mother Yudha does is, she says, Krishna, this grinding mortar is your accomplice in crime. You broke the pots and you spilled the butter and you gave it to monkey and monkeys. And how did you give it? By standing on this mortar. So because this mortar is your accomplice in crime, so I will tie, I will tie both of you together. And that's how she tries to tie both of them together. And in, at one level, Krishna is just like a small child who is fearful of his mother. But at another level, he is also God. And suddenly, so this is I said the predictability and unpredictability. The predictability is like a child, and a child who has been caught by doing after doing something wrong by his mother is fearful. And that's that's the predictable part. But suddenly Krishna manifests the unpredictable part. What is it? He's a child, but he's no ordinary child. His mother tries to tie him, and she's just not able to tie. She's just not able to tie. And when children are small, as children grow up, they dress themselves. When the children are very small, the parents dress them. So that very morning, Mother Yashoda has tied a thread around Krishna's waist. She said, the morning I tied, and that, that was a small thread I was able to tie. And now there is so much rope, and I'm not able to tell. What's going on? And she gets more rope. And she gets more rope. And it's not enough. And then Vrindavan has a small town mystique to it. A small town appeal to it. It's like in big cities, people often don't even know their neighbors. People live in apartments. But the apartments are not apart. You know, they are they are very close to each other. People might be living as neighbors, but they just don't know each other. But in small towns, everybody knows everyone. And if anything unusual happens in anyone's house, everybody comes to know about it. So in a sense, uh, nowadays people have this concern about privacy. And my private information should not be stolen or lost or misused. That's a valid concern. But in small towns and villages, there's no privacy. Everybody knows everybody else's life, what is going on in their homes and their lives. So now when Krishna is being caught and punished by Mother Yashoda, that news spreads everywhere. And all the other neighboring ladies come. And the men have gone out for, for, for taking care of the cows, for grazing them. So the ladies come and they say, Mother Yashoda is trying to tie and they are not able to tie. And they get ropes from their place. They get more and more and more rope, and still they are not able to die. And finally, Mother Yashoda is getting exhausted. And Krishna, he is, see, Krishna interacts at multiple levels. At one level, he is still upset with Mother Yashoda. He says, you, know, you, you made me run like that. Oh, I will make you run. And what make it not physically, she also ran physically earlier. But now she is running around trying to get more ropes. She, and she holds on to Krishna, others run around, get the ropes. And she, she gets exhausted. 
Krishna, what, what should I do now? He starts thinking. And now Krishna thinks, okay, I've played enough with that. And also the Acharya is describing that actually, initially Mother Yashoda is very angry. And anger is in the lower moods. It's in Rajas and Tamas. The lower moods of passion and ignorance. And then, as long as one is in the mode of passion and ignorance, one cannot perceive things clearly. Generally, when we are in passion, we overestimate our capacities. We think any problem I can solve it, any job I can do it. In, in ignorance, we underestimate our capacities. Every job seems too much. I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. But in goodness, we start estimating realistically. What is within my capacity and what is not within my capacity. So generally in the mode of goodness, perception becomes clear. So in, initially, Mother Yudha is in the mode of passion. She's upset and angry with Krishna. But as she keeps trying to tie Krishna, tie Krishna, she's not able to tie Krishna. She starts thinking, what is this wonderful, amazing, how amazing my child is. So her thoughts shift from her anger with Krishna to Krishna. And thus, she rises. At one level, she's always a pure devotee. But that time, she's, she rises from anger to appreciation of Krishna. How wonderful she is. And, Krishna is. and then, Krishna is not conquered by anyone who's in the lower moods. <laughs> But Krishna submits himself to be bound when his mother appreciates him out of her love. And then eventually, Krishna's, the ropes are two fingers short. But finally, she's able to tie them. So those two fingers represent our endeavor and God's grace. And whenever we have to do something, these two endeavor, these two, we have to do our part. And then God also has to bestow his grace. Then everything works out. So here it is said, Dhamo Dharam Stitagriva. We became fixed at one place, bound. How? Bhakti Baddham. He was not bound by ropes. The rope was simply a physical instrument. But the physical instrument was inadequate. Because what bound him was the love of her heart. The loving concern which she had. The great affection that she had. And Sri Krishna saw that. And out of that he was bound. So, this, again, this last frame, Bhakti Baddham, this also demonstrates the amazing inversion of hierarchy. Normally, we are all in this world Karma Baddham. And we are bound by our Karma. And it is, and one of the names of Bhagavan is Mukunda. Mukunda means the grantor, grantor of liberation. So we are bound and it is God who liberates us. But here what has happened? Here God is bound. And what is it that can bound the infinite? Bind the infinite? That is bhakti alone. Such is the power of love that Krishna demand, that is demonstrated in the pastimes of Vrindavan. With Krishna out of love for his devotees and seeing their love for him takes on a completely subordinate role. Being ready to become bound by them. And that all loving Krishna is present in the hearts of each one of us. He is present as the super soul, as the Paramatma. And he is present because he loves us, because he cares for us, because he wants the best for us. Ishwara Sarva Bhutana Vidyesha Arjuna Tishthati Brahmayan Sarva Bhutani Yantra Rudhani Mayaya so he resides in every heart and he guides everyone to take wise decisions. To, to direct, ultimately, the wisest decision is to direct our love towards the Lord. So he, we all want someone to love us. And not just someone to love us, but someone who is really lovable. Someone who is attractive, somebody who is powerful, somebody who is wise. We want to have a relationship with somebody like that. But here there is a supremely wise, supremely beautiful, supremely strong person who is already there in our heart. And he already wants to have a relationship with us. And the pastimes of Krishna are at one level descriptions of what has happened in the past. But they are also descript invitations that this is something we all can join in. 
they are uh, they are both a trailer of what happened like a movie has a trailer so this is watch the full movie so krishna leela is like a trailer we have seen some past times which are described in the, in the say, wisdom texts the bhakti texts but there are many many more past times that happen endlessly in the spiritual world so this is a trailer that we get and krishna's past times are not just a trailer they are also a trail trail means that they are the path if we absorb ourselves in krishna's past times we develop our devotion to krishna then by that absorption in him we can have elevation to him if we strive to remember him if we strive to make him our foremost love in the world then if we remember him throughout our life by practicing bhakti we'll remember him at the time of death and if we remember him at the time of death then we will attain his eternal abode for one who has devoted themselves to krishna then at death we won't leave home at death we will go home because home is the place where our loved ones are so if you practice bhakti diligently then krishna will become our greatest loved one and then at death we won't leave home we will go home and that is the invitation that these beautiful pastimes of krishna offer all of us that every one of us can direct our love toward krishna and experience loving reciprocation in this world and beyond in this world for all of eternity so i'll summarize i spoke on the topic of this how our longing for love is best fulfilled in krishna so we seek various things we will seek wealth looks positions possessions all so that we can become more lovable and we can gain love that is the universal longing in all living beings however the love that we get in the world is temporary it doesn't last forever this longing for love is best fulfilled when we direct it toward the lord he is all attractive and how he is all attractive is revealed in the bhakti tradition among all the various traditions in the world god is approached at different levels what are the four levels you remember fear desire, desire duty, duty and love so fear of god is the beginning of wisdom it is good to have fear but not that shouldn't be the basis of the relationship fear is a restrainer if a person has somebody has no fear of god then that person is we should have fear of that person because they have no conscience then beyond but that is a negative conception of god then there is desire where we think that god will provide me things that's a more positive conception but still it's utilitarian like a child approaching the parents only when they need money then there is duty we see what all god has already provided me and therefore i should be i should worship my service to him in reciprocation however in all these three the focus is on what god is giving me it's not primarily on god but at the level of love it's prime the focus shifts primarily to god and in that what is described is that actually krishna the bhakti tradition reveals how krishna is so how the ultimate reality is so lovable and that is through the concept of leela god does not delight in the display of godhood but he performs leela play past times for the sake of reciprocating love and in that even it it takes positions which are subordinate to his devotees this is a billionaire may play the role of a beggar beggar the lord who whom everyone fears he is in fear of his mother because he wants to reciprocate with the devotees who want to love him in a maternal mood and he also wants to relish love in it in all its flavors we talk about how a loving relationship has both a predictable and unpredictable aspect so krishna behaves like a child predictably at times and sometimes unpredictably he becomes mischievous so here i saw how krishna became mischievous and he broke some pots and he stole the butter and mother yashoda became upset not just because he had created a mess but because she was concerned about his future if love means that we are concerned about other person's feelings and their future which concern only for their feelings and not for the future is attachment concern only for the future and not their feelings is insensitivity so mother yashoda 
in this case because she is quite if krishna has a reputation of uh, being a thief then he will be ruined so then she decides to punish him and while punishing she tries to tie up krishna so uh, but krishna he plays and one play he plays the unpredictability is sometimes he acts as like ordinary child and sometimes like, like god the so he showed a universal universe within him here in now he mystically arranges so that the rope is always inadequate and thus the krishna has this endearing oscillation between like ordinary child and the divine child and finally when mother vishwas emotion shifts from anger toward krishna anger to appreciation of krishna her consciousness rises up and then krishna lets himself be tied and he's tied not by physical ropes but by actually the love of his mother by the devotion so that lord who is so hungry for love that he is ready to completely invert the cosmic hierarchy and people are bound in karma but he is himself bound that lord who is so loving is present in the hearts of all of us wanting us to love him and the practice of bhakti is the way by which we express our love for him and we have enter into a loving relationship with him and if we understand how loving krishna is then we see krishna's past times both as a trailer of how wonderful life with krishna is as well as a trail because remembering these past times absorbing ourselves in these past times enables us to become closer and closer to him till he becomes our foremost attachment and then at the time of death we won't leave home but we will go home thank you very much hare krishna <laughs>
Sometimes, just like a, every parent has a dream that oh, my child be extraordinary. And Krishna does something extraordinary. His mother is astounded. She is also delighted by it. So that's how Krishna basically does whatever is required to flavor and intensify the relationship with his mother. So his, uh, his oscillating between godhood and childhood, it's simply to intensify the relationship with his mother. Okay. Beyond that, there can be specific reasons and specific pastimes. Like in this pastime, you will see that he will bring down the trees and deliver the mm -hmm. celestials. So, contextually, each pastime may have a particular purpose. But overall, overall the purpose is flavor and intensify the relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. That was a very nice point you made that when we are in the mode of ignorance, then we underestimate and passion, we overestimate and goodness. Correctly. So, if I, if I map it to the professional life, you know, while we're in the office, so mostly the work is going on in the mode of passion. You know, we want to achieve this, you know, this kind of. So, how to basically go and take, in order to take the right decision, one has to be in the mode of goodness. So, how to do that? Yeah. yeah. So in our professional life, we are often in the mode of passion. We are in the mode of achieving. That's okay. It's not that Arjuna, when he was fighting the Kurukshetra war, he was Hare Krishna. Was he Hare Krishna? Was he in the mode of passion at that time? No, he was basically in transit. He was always served. His intent was transcendental. But the activity, he had to fight. That they calmly could, you know, he had to be busy, super fast, in fact. So, different roles may require different ways of functioning. But there is there's a time when we, like even in competitive circles, there's a time for planning, there's a time for debriefing. So, when we are in the heat of the moment, we may act fast. But there should be a time when we regulate ourselves. With respect to our professional life and even our sadhana that we do, that's also meant to anchor us in goodness. Now, we can't expect to always be in goodness because the world around us is in passion. But being completely in passion is also unhealthy. So when it is required, we might be in passion. See, being in passion is not a silly problem. Being controlled by the mode of passion is the problem. That means we can never go out of passion. But that's the problem. So using devices is fine. But some people just can't put down the device more. In like five minutes, they have to put down the device. So there are apps which you know somebody showed me an app called Zen Mode or something. They say that you make a commitment that the next 20 minutes you will not touch the phone, and then the phone gets locked for 20 minutes, and that causes anxiety to me. <laughs> 20 minutes, I can't look at my phone. <laughs> so, using a phone is no problem, it's, it's a vital necessity in today's world in many ways, but it is that being obsessed with it can be a problem. So being in, similarly, being in passion is not a problem. Being controlled by the mode of passion is a problem. So if we have other activities which you are doing in goodness and you are overall regulating ourselves, then that's, that's it's reasonable enough. We can't exist like transcendental bubbles unaffected by the world around us. We have to function in the world. But we don't have to be consumed by the world and its value systems. We try to maintain our value system and function in the world. Did I answer your question? So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Shri Damodar Bhagwan ki, Gaur Bhakta Bhagwan ki, Gaur Priman.